Hello, and this is Tagore Almeida from the Uncultured Company, and welcome to my podcast, A Pint of Ambitious Wisdom, basically conversations to make a better world. This is season one, episode four, and we are talking about the performing arts. Now, if you need to Google and look up what that means, then it's really a big shame. The performing arts has always been one of the pil- pillars of our cultural society. In a digital age, and often very product-focused environment, we have forgotten the touch of our own imagination. Marketeers will tell us to create products that the masses will relate to, to create products that are precise and focused in a certain way that basically want us to spoon-feed the audience with everything we want to tell them and make use of the time that the audience are investing into the product, which is rubbish. Then what happens to the art of using your own imagination? We have become so lazy in a way that we want everything to be spoon-fed to us, not just the story, but we want the story to be told to us in a way that it's clear, precise, where we just soak it in like sponges and not have to use our imagination. And that's really a shame because when we have lost the art to use our imagination, then we have lost the art to be alive. Uh, because imagination is what keeps it all going for us. That's why parents tell their kids, don't spend so much of time in front of a television, go read a book. Because when you read a book, for example, when you listen to music, when, uh, when you're watching theater uh, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, and so forth, your mind plays a role in that, that you have to be able to go and listen to that and imagine what is you're soaking in. So today with me I have Ranjan Kamath, definitely a torchbearer of the performing arts, especially in India. He has dedicated his life to the cause. He's absolutely as genuine and sincere as they come. Uh, very old fashioned in some ways, but that's good because he talks about the discipline about being involved in these arts, you know, and he he dabbles with uh, theatre, with cinema, with poetry, with music, with literature. And some of the initiatives that he does are absolutely mind-blowing. He's keeping the travelling theatre concept alive, but he's taking theatre to living rooms. Uh, he's doing uh, a, a great initiative where he's celebrating women and their struggles and their success stories. He's doing another thing where he's taking historic moments in India and he's connecting with people who were around uh, these uh, these events and getting their experience of, as to what they were doing when these historical moments took place. He's also recording a lot of literature. He's been uh, uh, you know, onto sound space and trying to keep literature alive as well in in its true form. So I have with me today Ranjan Kamath, who is a performing artist. And when I say that, I don't just use that term loosely. If you look at what he's been doing and what he's invested his life into doing, it really is a immense, excuse me, immense pleasure to be able to talk to someone of his caliber. So. Ranjan, welcome to my show and say hello to all of us. Thank you, Tabo. Glad to be here. Yeah. Oh, pleasure is all mine. So, Ranjan, before we go into our actual questions that we want to talk about, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and you know, I know that you went London. Uh, you went to the the drama school of London. You did some work in the EU. You've been reading for the British Council. But give us a give us a just for everything about yourself. Okay, in brief, uh, I grew up in, in Kolkata, Calcutta, which was probably the, the best place to grow up in the country because whether you like it or not, you're immersed in two things, politics and culture. Yeah. And uh, I, I studied, I had a Jesuit education at St. Xavier's and uh, I graduated in political science because I, I actually my my first inclination was to to become a diplomat you know the the oh, wow. so to, to join the foreign service and all 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 the idealism and the you know the which which, which, which comes with that uh but i think i was dissuaded along the way because my, as one of my uncles who was in the foreign service said i don't think you'll make a very good footmat <laughs> so <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I, I was I was already sort of immersed in drama from a very young age, and I was in informal training in drama. Uh, so, which is what I really wanted to pursue. I wanted to, you know, to 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 do my postgrad in, in dramatic arts. But this was in the late mid '80s, early '80s, when you know, if you did go to drama school. Uh, what would you do back in India? You wouldn't be able to earn a living, and someone said Correct. you you in the back row of some British production, you know, for for a two-minute role, and that seemed a very bleak prospect. And uh, so, of, uh, I was all equally interested in the cinemas, and 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 that seemed, you know, the application of cinema to you reach a wider audience. So that seemed very attractive. Uh, so soon after graduation, I went to Bombay and I worked as a dog's body for two to three years. Uh, you know, traveled the country, working on documentaries. Did even acted in the feature film. Uh, put my portfolio together, and then of course I applied to the London Film School, which I joined in '87, and I was there till '90. Wow. And uh, thereafter, I spent the next what 25 years, you know. Working in film, so I was a cinematographer, and I've done film work for Nat Geo and Discovery, and everybody there, you know, sort of that I could work for. Travelled the length and breadth of the country, and that was my real education. I actually got to know India, travelling the country from you know Kanyakumari to 18,000 feet, left, right, you know, sort of. So, so that was amazing, and. Uh, Yeah, uh, and that happened till about two thousand five, when when I had to, for personal circumstances, I had to get back to drama, you know, and I had to move to Bangalore, and that's when I sort of went back to. I, I never thought I'd earn a livelihood of of, of drama, and uh, so from two thousand five, I started getting teaching, you know. And I started with two students, and over the next ten, fifteen years, I worked with hundreds of students. Wow! And uh, it it was great fun because you actually helped personalities blossom, you know. And uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed watching, you know, the transformation of youngsters, and you know, uh, sort of being able to mentor them. And uh, it, it 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 was amazing. So. Uh, and then recently, uh, with, with my boys grown up, I decided to get back into cinema. And so now, now it's a parallel. I have one foot working with you know cinema, one foot working in performing arts, and uh, and sort of everything in between. So that's that's the story in a nutshell. So th- before I ask you my first question, something you just said right now. So you have invested so much of your time and your passion into drama. Why didn't you just? Be happy like the rest of us, doing one thing and saying, you know what, to go. I became an actor, but instead, you actually went and ventured into so many mediums of performing art. What what was the transition, and why did that happen? Well, you know, uh, in Europe, you find uh, people in the performing arts migrate between one form and the other. You know, so a filmmaker will be directing opera. He'll be writing poetry. He'll be doing that, and you know, and the purpose of that is that you know, when you stick to one thing, you perhaps tend to burn out in terms of ideas. You know, when you're approaching that, the best thing to do is take a break, go into some other form, look at it from another perspective. You know, refresh yourself, and then enrich. Your other form with the ideas you develop there, and I find that you know I find that very very enriching myself. You know, so uh, every time sort of I feel that I'm not seeing in some form, then I move to the other. You know, if I'm writing poetry and I find okay it's not flowing, then I, I don't force it. I just take a break and go in, go into drama, work with that. You know, go into cinema, work with that. Shut up and just watch and do for take for photographs. You know. And uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I I know that's not the way things are done here, where people like to pigeonhole you. They want Correct. to know you as you know thing A or thing B or thing B, and you're a specialist at that and nothing else, you know. And perhaps that's been, in a way, detrimental to how people perceive you. But uh, uh, I think 
in and in terms of my personal growth i have no regrets in doing that and i would you know i would do that over and over again that oh, ability to, yeah. and complete respect to you i mean as i said i mean i've not come across someone like yourself for a very long time and, and definitely not in the past decade or so so it's like it's this is really cool stuff so talking about performing arts in ranjan where is performing arts today in the world and especially where is it in india well uh, immediately in the post pandemic performing arts is uh, i think uh, you know up shit creek without a paddle <laughs> which, which which is uh, you know <laughs> which, 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 which is yeah. very very unfortunate because i believe it is the most needed thing in terms of addressing the mental health uh, of of the planet and it is it is getting the least priority and the least support you know uh, while we are you know obsessed with vaccinating the planet against covid i think no one's ever thinking of what are the after the mental health aftermath of people who have been locked away for so long you know and right. especially children for 8 9 10 months how do they get to express themselves how do they get to address all this you know so uh which which has been the fate of the performing arts i mean for forever and ever it's nothing new uh you see for me the performing arts space is a laboratory you know where you uh-huh. do everything that you can't do in the real life space where you resolve it and then you go back and you apply it not to pay attention i mean like with any r&d work that you do nothing develops without r&d right Correct. So why do we discount that? Why do we discount performing arts? You know, we 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 always regard it as useless space in the art. The first thing to be dispensed dispensed with when 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 there's a budget cut. You know, um, do you dispense with R and D in anything else you do? It's 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 critical to any work in science and tech, everything else. So how on earth can you remove? R R N D, which is the performing arts space, where you work out, you know, you work out your 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 problems, you work out, uh, you know, resolutions, solutions by playing characters, by being who you are not, and uh, then saying, well, wow, you know, I've resolved that, and you go back and you apply, you know, and the fact is that, you know, we regard. the performance arts space is something separate in our lives is something marginal you know it, it's what we do when we've got nothing else to do to time pass you know what we call but we forget that every day each one of us is playing multiple roles you know where someone's son where someone's father mother where someone's sibling where someone's friend where someone you know so any given day we're playing 8 to 10 roles you know which we seamlessly interchange through the day and we don't call that a performance yeah you see but the fact is that we need to be at the top of our of our game with each one of these relationships you know so, so to, to make the best of it yeah so how do you do that you do that in the performance art space and then come and apply it in real life and you take real life and then you try it out again in the performance art space mm. so the symbiosis is very critical to our well being you know and if we if we sort of uh, do not allow children you know regard if you treat it as unimportant then as i have been watching with uh, with uh, you know uh, with, with sadness is that we are creating robots you know lacking empathy and we we're seeing the aftermath of that across the world you know correct and i think a lot of it at least especially in india i think a lot of how off screen emotions are influenced by what you see on screen as a reaction to certain situations and and that's because we're just not connecting as our our honest self if you know what i mean we are trying to emulate some the character that we saw on screen which is a fictional character but i think we've kind of losing that line between reality and what's what's and what isn't you know yeah. you know it's especially in i think in you know countries sort of east of the suez where conformity is the is the order of 
of the game, you know, where you're meant to social conformities, you know, and so the chance to express yourself is is, is very little, you know. We 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 are you know uh, sort of limited by you know caste, creed, community, this, that, and the other. So where do you get a chance to express your individuality if not in where is the neutral space where you can do that, you know? And I think you know the more now now it's got more and more rigid. So you know if you're pressure cooking in an environment like that, you know, and if everyone is pressure cooking like that, you're definitely going to have an explosion sooner or later in some form or the other in the violence the the way women are treated and so on and so forth endlessly and we, we are seeing yeah. how it's manifesting itself so i think you know that's that's where we need to create spaces where people can express themselves in some form of the other performing arts yeah. literature however you know but even there we're imposing censorship you can say this you can't say this you can't crack a joke you can't do this you know it's uh, it's uh, i mean it, 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 it pressurizing and creating conformity to the extreme and in 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 especially in our country i think the censor board has become more of a police board than being yes. a censor board which yes. is yes. 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 not what yeah. it was meant to be there in the first place you know? Exactly. Uh, You're undermining yeah. the intelligence of an of a nation, you know, by 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 doing that. Exactly. I mean, I, you know, like five people are deciding deciding the cultural mindset of an entire nation, yeah. Uh, yeah. which which, <laughs> which, which is, is ridiculous. Which yeah. is ridiculous. So, deep diving a little more into performing arts, let's let's look at theatre first. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. once upon a time, there was there was quite a. I wouldn't say a great theatre culture, but there was a theatre culture in India. All right, you had in Bombay, you had Prithvi, and you had all of these sort of you know uh, theatre happening in Marathi, in in Hindi, in English. I'm talking about Bombay itself, and I'm sure there's you know regional theatre happening all over India as well. Has theatre now taken a back seat, okay, to people wanting to be actors in cinema, for whatever reason that may be? Has Theatre become an afterthought, you think? Well, you know, theatre has always had a tough time surviving. And, you know, it, it has always required patronage at some point of time. You know, there has been the state patronage, where, I mean, giving grants to different groups to sustain. For example, I was very close to one of the most renowned groups in the country, which is Naya Theatre, Habib Sandhi's Naya Theatre, which has been in existence since 1958. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't for grants coming from the government, that group would not have been able to sustain it. You know, and uh, the actors said that they've gone through three decades of work on what they call half khali. You know, okay. so, so it's about, you know, that their entire life has been half khali. So today, those actors, whether they like it or not, will, you know, grab the first role in television or cinema and exactly that's what's been happening you know so uh those who really want to sustain themselves only through theater you know just simply cannot do so for because the the e economy is not there to support it you know i mean theater requires patronage and uh, if that generosity is not there then then you know uh, it, it simply can't survive and anywhere else in the world i mean you know europe subsidizes their their theater and their opera and their performing arts to the tune of billions of euros you know we which which is here and you 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 can't get two paisa together to to do anything you know so how on earth do you expect those who really love it to to do it you know it's, it's just uh, it's sad so they have to migrate <laughs> So, uh, keeping keeping in uh, on the subject of theatre itself, then I haven't met a single individual who said this to me. I want to be an actor in films, so I need to understand the discipline. But the moment you meet somebody who says I want to be an actor in theatre, comes that whole mindset of like you know, I need to have the discipline of acting, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? You think that? I, I, and I'll say this again. In, especially in Bollywood cinema, which I'm slightly involved with, the people that I meet who want to act, you know, they're you know what their uh, their bio data is. I worked on mm -hmm. my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. They've gone to the gym, 
uh-huh. and, and and they've qualified to become a Bollywood actor. Right, right. If you're doing a stage show and somebody comes and says, "I want to act in theatre," they usually come with some sort of a bio data saying, "I've been to this acting school or I've yeah. act, acted in that." What is you think the reason behind that? Is it the medium mm-hmm. itself? Because you know, with with cinema, you can do multiple takes, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you get told how to do it. So, what's your take on that? I mean, you know, having trained actors for the last what fifteen years plus, uh, and having trained myself, you know, theater that space doesn't give you a second chance. Correct. You know, there is no second chance. There is no second take, right? You've got to get it right the first time. There's only one performance, and you've got to get it right the first time. Mm. So, you know, if you let me use an an, an analogy that if you were, you know, uh, training as a commando, your very life depends on it, right? Because one mistake and you're dead, right? Correct. Transfer the analogy to stage. One mistake. you know with that performance and you've let the character down okay one wrong look one wrong breath you know one word said in you know with with the in inaccurate intention and that's it you've destroyed the character you know so if you put in that kind of grueling work to become you know a navy seal or front you know commando and you know you So it's the same kind of thing. You get this one chance at this operation, and you've got there. There, there, there is no, you know, uh, thing. You, you, you have to, you have to do it. And besides which, in the theatre space, you're doing maybe two shows a day or three shows a day, and you've got to get it right all the time. Right. You know, and you get into that space, whether you're a headache, whether you're dying, whether you've got family problems, whatever the case may be. As soon as that curtain goes up, you've got to put it all aside. So. Where do you derive that mental and physical strength from? It is in the preparation, you know. It is in the spiritual and the physical preparation that you know you put that aside. You put on your mask and you put on your costume, and now you're, you know, you're that character. So, in 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 cinema, you don't do that. You know, in 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 cinema, you 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 know you 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 can cheat as much as you want. The camera is helping you cheat. You know, so so it's uh, it's 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 altogether. uh different I'm, i'm not saying it it's an inferior form which i don't think so but it requires a different uh you know a different methodology to performance so i was reading your profile and you did a transition from and i won't see a complete sort of move across the fence but you moved from drama into cinema at some stage of your career what was the reason for that and and how and how did how different was it for you as an artist to be able to have one foot in both you know both sides of the fence well you know i i grew up doing a lot of drama so soon after school i mean through school and even after that you know there was a, so calcutta was full of amateur amateur drama but as i said you know once i went to film school then i had to put drama aside and then i was working in 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 cinema you know sort of uh, i mean that was there and then i got back to it in uh, in the two in the early 2000s you know where uh, you know some some there was some need to sort of get back to that i i didn't want to lose lose touch with it all together and uh, so yeah i i i got back you know i i started training in kalari pat and uh, which i which i still practice and that that helped me to develop myself and uh, now i have you know it's, it's taken me the last two decades to now immerse myself significantly in in drama because i think you know quite simply it's a very important space because of its immediacy you know what you can do in drama at zero cost you know would cost a lot of money to do in cinema besides which you know i believe that you can perform anywhere anyhow anytime is ways the way i do it you know in fact this afternoon we're going into someone's living room and staging three one act plays wow I'll, yeah and, and, i've got a question for you on that yes yeah. carry on so, so so that's what i've been that's what i've been working on post the pandemic and saying 
you know, would you rather perform to a 50% occupied theater, you know, which can't sustain itself in the first place and looks half empty, or look at is a living room which is full, mm. you know, and have the intimacy of the connect with every member of the audience, you know, and it it is magic, you know. And uh, so, so what I have been doing since October is taking theater into people's living rooms, and I'm also looking at taking acoustic music into people's living rooms and saying, okay, you're worried about getting to the theater, you're worried about the traffic, you're worried about health and all that, right? Let's play completely safe. You put on your mask, and we'll keep our distance, and we will do it safely, and we'll do all the precautions, and with the magic, you know. And believe me, when we first staged. Yeah, yeah, our plays in October. For the first time, I saw an audience not look at a mobile phone in 90 minutes, and I thought I'd got something right in life. Yeah, you know? yeah. If I can keep 12 to 20 people totally fixed for 90 minutes without even glancing at their phone. Right? I think, you know, that's the way forward. Absolutely. Why can't we turn everybody's living room, every garden, every space into a performance space? You know, build the community again and use that in the use, the performing arts, the conversation as a platform for, for, for everything that we do. You know? So, yeah, that, that's, that's the way. And hopefully bring back the flavor of theater to these people, you know. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. this also, you're not sitting and, uh, you know, sort of uh, paying expensive tickets and, you know, making excuses. Yeah, it's you choose to bring it into your space and enjoy that 90 minutes, you know, yeah. unadulterated quality time. This reminds me of this concept called traveling theaters back in the mm -hmm. days when, you know, little groups of people went around traveling to schools, villages and everything. And and the content was very high on moral values and, you know, yep. It's, yep. It, it's inspiring mankind and so forth. So, and that's a completely dead art at the moment, eh? I mean, traveling theatre, does it still happen? But that's how theatre has always been done. Anywhere in the world, it was about that. You're performing in the street and you're performing in the square and you're performing in the church and you're performing in any little space that you get and you're setting up and doing it, you know? Uh, so this business of, you know, sort of locking it away on stage is a very Western, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very new, you know, that you've locked it away, you've confined it to the proscenium. Well, and, and I think that it's perhaps one of the good things about the pandemic is that it's going to unlock that and it should un unlock that, you know, and it just, op you have to open up spaces because the economics is going to drive that perhaps. How economical is it? Uh, doing theater, like you know, uh, as a traveling theater artist, or doing it in living rooms for twenty people, for example, is it really, is it really feasible, or is it not about the money at all? Well, uh, I would like to say it's not about the money. That's not true. Okay. okay yeah. But but uh, the way we're working is is that I I don't believe that theater can be transactional. You know, but so so, so what's the mm. middle ground? Uh, because I think theatre is beyond putting a value, you know, it, it, it's something special. So the way I do it is that I tell the audience, you make your contribution, you know. Yeah. So you decide whether it's been worth it. If you, if you feel that you want to walk out and don't put a penny in the hat, that's okay. You know? But okay. I, believe in, I believe in the kindness of, 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 of humankind and I believe that at some point of time someone will say, guys, these Dave guys put us so much of effort, so at least some amount is worthwhile. And I think in the long term, if we can build that way of doing things, you know, we uh, I think that, you know, just, just, just trust the trust humanity and, you know, it will sustain that, eco that, that economy, you know, rather than demand you know 200 and 500 rupees and then people say that wasn't worth it and i could do this for that much of money and then yeah. you're devaluing theater you know and i think you can't afford to do that so that relationship becomes very special and whatever is given is is you know is accepted is is accepted gracefully and i think uh, in due course of time we will be able to sustain that way you know, because it is a zero cost form of doing it so you know 
Mm. If we can, we, with everything we're doing these days, it's about zero cost, zero whatever uh, effect of the environment. So let's see if we can leave a, you know, maximum footprint with with, with zero with at zero cost. And and here's the thing, right? I mean, in a in a in a house full theater, you don't know how many people are in there for the love of theater, because in a, for many it's a social thing to say I went to the theater exactly. last night. Or people get gifted tickets by corporates and whatever, but in a living room, with the 15, 20 people that you have in there, you know that all 20 of them have have an investment into the art. Absolutely. Yeah. Not only into the art, into the emotion. Into the emotion you know, of it, correct. More important yeah. that you're sharing as you know human being to human being, and you're telling you know these 12 or 20 people a story directly, and they're listening. And I think that is really, really you know very precious. Okay, so okay, uh, I'm very heavily vested in cinema, by the way. Okay, yeah. I mean, I I prefer that as being my medium of expression, and mm -hmm. e even though I don't do it full time, I've just done a couple of short films, and I've been able to tell the stories that I want to tell. But yeah. I've noticed that our mainstream cinema in India, especially in Chennai, Hyderabad, and definitely in Bollywood, uh, in Mumbai, I think there's a certain thing that has happened where it's it's detached itself from the morals of humanity, you know? And what goes out there is something that will sell, something that is cheap, it's, you know, it's, and, and that's all it is. And I don't blame the filmmakers as much as I blame the audience, because if, if the audience didn't suck that in, these guys wouldn't be making that sort of a uh, product, right? Mm -hmm. Given the way we are today with our cinema, our mainstream cinema, how difficult do you think it's going to be for us to move back as an audience to be appreciative of the sort of work that you're doing? Well, you know, I think the uh, very fascinating things have been happening in cinema worldwide. You know, with, uh, as you said, the dumbing down has happened, not not only just in Bollywood or Tollywood, it's happened worldwide. You know, so, so America has led it with Marvel and DC Comics you know, taking over the, the the whole the whole exercise. But I think uh, we also have to be thankful to the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime because they have you know suddenly let loose so much of cinema, you know, and there are sort of youngsters and indie filmmakers who've been able to populate that space, and now you know they, they need to sort of you know. Uh, so, so there is an abundance of the smaller, lower by the, the, the small budget films, which are wonderful stories. Yeah. You know? So I think if at some point of time, uh, you know, the the big guys will realize that you know the, the way, that the, it's, it's not working anymore. We, we we go through those cycles. We go through those cycles. It'll take on a new form. You know, today people are watching more cinema on a you know you're watching on a post-it post-it stamp size screen you know so 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 yeah. so that's the downside you know so the magic of cinema is at the moment in a hiatus so we, we don't know when it will come back and if you can afford the cinema it's going to be very expensive so it's going to be like going to the circus once upon a time it's going to be that you know uh, yeah. In the West, they're going to pay $150 to go to the cinema and see an IMAX. It's going to be the same thing here, you know. So, most people will be watching cinema on the OTT now, you know. You are going to watch it at the biggest, probably, is on your television set. But, you know, the chance of going to a big screen is going to be less. So, the big screen is going to look after the magic and the big things and the small screen is going to look at the stories. You know, that, that, that's where it's going to happen. So each thing yeah. is going to cater to a particular form of cinema. And that, that's how it's going to sort of, you know, uh, distribute itself across platforms. But with the influx of the OTT platforms in the world, what is the impact of that going to be on, on performing arts, be it cinema, music, theatre, you know, poetry? I mean, because now, as you rightly said, once upon a time, you have to save up your money and go to a cinema, make the effort to get there and, you know, block that time to be entertained. Now you do it in the comfort of your home, on the way to work, on the train, with your little mobile phone and so forth. So content is coming to you. It's begging 
for your attention, right? Mm-hmm. So given that fact is how is that going to impact performing art on the whole, including cinema that we once traditionally known cinema to be like? You know, uh, I am being heartened by the fact that there is something called Zoom fatigue. <laughs> Yeah. If that is any sign, I think that kind of fatigue will also affect, you know, all digital platforms. Okay. How much can you sustain looking at a screen during work, after work? You know, at some point of time, you want to take a break from that, and you want to engage with other human beings in a space. You know. So even if it's so. a, yeah. you know, even if it's a chai shop or you're listening to poetry somewhere or something like that, or even a gossip session in the coffee house, you know, but at some point of time you want to take a break from the screen. So I am hoping that it, you know, it it will you know take its course and it, you know because right now there's just a surfeit of everything on the digital platform, you know, and I think people are that that fatigue is already set in. You know, especially with working also on the digital platform you do not do not want to stare at that same screen okay. you know for entertainment you know? yeah so i'm i'm just i don't know i it, it, it perhaps it's early days but i am just hoping that uh, you know with this whole idea of the alternative of actually being able to take you know for the performing arts in some form into the into the into the home space into the community space the people say hey this this makes sense you know this so so i i can take a break once in a while and i can go and listen you know participate in some storytelling tell a poem you know, poem, you know be a part of a theater thing you know so you know i i i'm hoping that 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 becomes gradually grows you know and and the community returns yeah. and i don't know whether it's going to be a reality reality or not like how we have youtube today which is a platform to host everything and anything you know whether mm-hmm. it's a short film it's to, it's to hold a live band performance or spoken yep. word poetry whatever i mean with with that culture change i think you know it will be good for the performing arts to find a new medium a new platform you know to sort of put out their work out there for example as you said i mean you, you go into people's living rooms yeah but you you yeah. must just decide after having done it 100 times to then this mount three cameras and perform it and put it into youtube thus reaching a wider audience and saying if you liked it click the donate button for example mm-hmm. you know so there's an opportunity there i definitely think so for performing arts to benefit from the digital era yeah but that is one line i do not think the performing arts must cross okay because that is yeah because that is self destructive oh wow See, okay yeah i think that that is what happened you know at the beginning of the pandemic where worldwide irrespective of whether you were the national theater or the royal shakespeare company or the berlin philharmonic everyone rushed into the digital space to put their material out you know they opened their archives and they did all sorts of things in their performances which they were you know preparing for that year everything was just put into the digital space consequently what you have done is you have devalued your product your oh, wow. your your program okay yeah okay. so you have now made it free okay oh. okay you have made it free for 10 months suddenly you're going to tell people we are going back to charging you know 20 pounds or 30 dollars or whatever for a ticket and you're going to say why correct now those are the big players what about the small people Yeah. you know who have also rushed in there and said see see me too me too me too i have also got a performance you know so in that phenomenon the whole performing arts has been in self destruct mode by saying by occupying that digital space you had something very special okay and i refuse to cross that line you know so if you in fact so many people have said please as you said you know film with and we we will contribute and said yeah. nothing doing you know okay I know it's an interesting performance right but it is special there is something special about the performing space is that you come into that space unfortunately you do it in your country and I'll do it in my country and that's about it you know so i mean it's 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 like it's like worship 
right? There, there, there is one thing watching, you know, a religious service online and saying I'm participating in that, which, which, which is a sharad, and actually being there in the sanctuary of that space, be it mosque, temple, church, you know, and the aura and the energies of that space, correct? And it's the same way in the performance space. There is an aura and there's an energy to it. Very like, well said, it's actually. It's a spiritual experience. Yeah. So, you know, you can't purchase that. Yeah. So you have to be there and, you know, you, what, what you are being, you're participating in that experience, which is, I think, at the the, the, the bedrock of, of, human, of, of humankind. You know, that ability to interact in this space and to derive from each other through performance. You know, get closer to... God or whatever, you know, universal mm. uh, force you believe. In. No, very well said, actually. Yeah, that's a very, very valid point. And I'm glad you raised that up. So, uh, moving a little bit now, poetry, spoken word. Yeah. Uh, I quite, I mean, you know, I've al al always loved listening to poetry and I'm al I also like watching uh, uh, spoken word. Uh, your take on, I, I know that you you also dabble with poetry as well. And uh, so when do you, and I know somewhere you said that poetry is when you want to express your voice to yourself mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. So what is, what is the opportunity for poetry and for spoken word today in the world? Well, I think, you know, poetry has always thrived, especially in India, you know, where be it in the, even our song is, a, you know, whether it's the Hindi lyrics, you know, film lyrics, whatever, it's always poetry, you know. Uh, so, uh, I think in, in terms of, uh, in the English language in India, I think it's very marginalized, you know, it, it occupies more space in the, in the other languages. Yeah, you know, which is fair. And, uh, yeah, which, which is which is fine. So, so poetry, I, I think, is I mean, the spoken word is has, has has always had its space because it's easy to do. You know, you 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 can set up anywhere, go anywhere, and you know you mm. can get people listening to it. So, so it's it's, it's a no cost performance art. You know, I think, uh, but where it's I think the issue is about the audience. The audience is no more sensitized to poetry. And I'll tell you why. With the onset of the IT age, you know, oh. our language has been reduced to data. Okay. So the language of cave paintings, which were pictures, and the language of Shakespeare, which was also pictures, you know, creating pictures, and you know, poetry, which is about visual metaphors and analogies, is all pictures. Right now, if you have taken the pictures out of language and it's only about the communication of data, right? Consequently, you have destroyed the imagination of generations. Okay. Oh. So when they when they listen to poetry or they read poetry, they're not seeing the pictures. You know, they're only getting words. You see. So it's no. It's so so. That's what has happened. So you have to start cultivating the audience and saying, you know, you've got to get them to, you know, re refire off the imaginations again, see those pictures, you know, enjoy the music of language, you know, so that there's a long way to go. So it's, it's not that there's less poetry or less spoken word. I think it's about, you know, the drop in appreciation for that. You know, we are so used to people shouting on television, haranguing all over the place. So it's all about noise. Where do we yeah. have a time to listen to music? You know, the music of language, the music of poetry. You know, it's just not happening. Yeah, correct. Correct. And that and that's the same thing happening with music, by the way. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Music today is just synthesized, loops, recorded. Yeah, it's and, the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's it. And, and and that's what's happened. I very rarely, you know, uh, have seen come across a musician who's just picked up his instrument and played what his soul wants him to play. It's always trying to uh, imitate something or copy a loop from a song and you know modify it a bit and remixing it and whatever, which is an art in its own, you know, in its own way. But 
what's happening with music today you think especially in india is there really a a market or a space for non film music i think there is i think you know i just taking off on what you just said i think a lot of the music is has become like electronic impulses you know which is meant to stimulate the brain and do nothing more you know so you just just keep the brain on a high by pumping in this you know these frequency noises rather than anything to do with music having said that i think uh, you know with the likes of the spotify and the soundcloud and all that there has been a there is a, you know every musician now has a chance to to get out there and put their stuff out uh but the point is that it's a very very crowded space so you have to be doing something really outstanding or unique to stand out in the crowd you know and i have found i mean i think uh, especially uh you know in india music some some musicians are extremely well equipped to stand out you know i i have seen performances of jazz being done in carnatic style i have seen mozart being you know performed vocally you know by by amazing stuff amazing performances you know so uh yeah i i think it's really you have to push the envelope to come up with something really outstanding or you know it's to do with your lyrics or your voice or both you know but if you are part of the 99.9% who are doing cover you know other other people's covers and you're sort of rehashing pink floyd and you know that kind of thing that they that, that's it i mean you know you 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 pass to expiry date you know or if if you are copying reggae and putting in you know, you're copying uh, rap and putting it into form and believing that i mean we have our own rhythms you know so so why can't we work with that why do we have to copy something that's organically part of the black culture and then saying now we're making it ours and you rip it off you know it's not happening you know use your bhangra for heaven's sake use use the use the carnatic rhythms there are so many rhythms in this country that you can put music to the bauls singers you know for example or the bengal you know so every region has its traditions we're not tapping into those but we'll copy the you know from from, from across the pond and bring yeah. it here with the thanks to bollywood and then make a complete hash of it and believe that this is great mm, true uh for so we talked about cinema we talked about music we talked about poetry a bit fortunately literature is still very much alive in india we've had some great writers uh, on our landscape and we still have a lot of literature festivals in india so where are we with literature in your opinion I well I you know I I think uh, this whole literature festival thing is 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 a gimmick is a business exercise <laughs> and if, if 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 chetan bhagat is our index of thriving literature then 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 then, then the situation is extremely depressing <laughs> <laughs> sorry i should so, be laughing at that goal so, so 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 i think it's, it's even more alarming than the covid virus is chetan bhagat's literature you know <laughs> and if uh, be, be, between chetan bhagat and sudha murthy being the benchmark for children's literature you know that 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 is not a good situation to be in no yeah yeah so 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 i think i think you know uh literature is caught in a bind you know there is no outstanding work coming out you know and it's been caught in between one award and the other between one festival and the other and it's in an incestuous uh, you know sort of loop uh, you know and i think that that is a problem because because you know if that for the for example if there's great regional literature it is not seeing the light of day it is okay. not seeing translation you know uh mm. the, the the kind of work that you know penguin did by bringing out you know literature in all languages say 10 or 20 years ago is not happening the the the, the book uh, the publishers is going exactly the way of the film uh, channel so everyone's buying out the others yeah. and you're making this mega mega publishing thing which is going to cater to the lowest common denominator and yeah. uh, that it, it's it's goodbye to i think it's goodbye to the uh the the sort of uh pollination of lit- in a bit the, the the proliferation from one language to the other you know yeah. because it's not that everything great is written in english 
but it, it is it is the great stuff which is written in other languages be it you know uh, spanish or be it in hindi or be it which is not going to see translation into english you know so uh, and i think that would be uh, sort of impoverish you know english if it is going to be so so you're going to get the same cycle of stuff coming out you're going to read only which goes up for the book awards and it everything else doesn't matter you know so it's all become one monumental marketing gimmick you know yeah. which 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 is sort of you know commandeered by a handful of publishers and they determine what uh, what is good and what uh, you know and then it becomes a talk of social social channels and book clubs and whatever else that we only read what is there in the book awards you know mm. so i i i really <coughs> believe this unhealth sorry yeah so uh, yeah i mean i i, th- I think of of all the art of all the forms i i think uh, bad literature is in the most trouble oh okay yeah so yeah. it's great that you said this about literature because not all literature has to you know is written in english there is a lot of regional lit- literature that you know is worth translating into other regional languages let alone international languages and that's great uh so what i wanted to talk about now is wanted to come back now f- make it personal make it about you <laughs> okay mm-hmm. so there's a lot of things that i saw that you were doing you're doing this thing called mitra tantra yeah so what's that about ah uh mitra tantra is my project for the rest of my life okay, okay. i when, when i was growing up i used to take the newspapers apart and create these monumental books archives you know material till my mother the, the moment i left the house she took the whole lot and burnt them up oh so gosh so i'm a pathological archivist you know and i think i you know growing up watching great people pass away without leaving anything behind and i felt you know there's so uh two years ago i said uh, I, i think it with, with my mother's passing and you know you with, with with your parents you say some day i'm going to record it some day i'm going to yeah. do this and it never happened and suddenly they're gone and you know that's it and that's when i said okay i'm getting to work on this and so this began uh, mid 2018 where i wanted to record people's life story you know? without without any window dressing whatever tell me about your failures tell me what you how why you know yeah. about what didn't go, go right and all that kind of yeah. you know so just meandering conversations and uh, so in the last year and a half i have done 20 such conversations ranging from anything between 2 hours to 7 and 8 hours you know with the likes of everyone from Bharat Ratna Prof- professor C N R Rao and Kirish Kasravali the filmmaker and writers and all you know across the board including just very ordinary people and it has been the most fascinating exhilarating learning experience from all these people because about the wonderful thing when you ask people to tell their stories and you listen is they open their hearts up you know and it's completely unedited uncensored you know for sort of great great stuff from the heart so once i record these stories then i curate them into what is today the attention span of about 90 seconds to 3 minutes so i break up a conversation into clips you know so that you can listen to as much as you want like you would read a book you know maybe sometime you'd read a page sometimes you'd read a paragraph sometimes you'd read a few pages before you you got so that ability to be able to do that to 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 treat a conversation like that and listen to as much as you want you know is is what the object was and yet that whole story is there for you to listen to you know the idea of a video autobiography you know so these archives are which are on youtube right now and uh, i'm still in the process of uh, i'm i'm constantly doing that is about putting this material out curated so that it can serve tomorrow as an alternative to an education in school so rather than read a textbook you listen to a person you know you listen to what they did on independence day in in, in august 15th 1947 what were they doing you listen to their experiences of partition you listen to you know the kind of coffee that their 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 their, their grandmother made you know because there were no rations so you listen to the you know 
uh, what they were doing in jail during the emergency. You know, so you get first-hand accounts of events. In this time of fake news, you get absolute spirit of his mouth. And you can create a 360 experience of an event without being there by virtue of listening to all these other people who've been there. You know? And very interestingly, what came of that is that you also get uh, a third person view, like, like it's, you know, you get biographies of people built on the accounts of other people who have interacted with them. You know, so for example, you know, many people who have met Jawaharlal Nehru or met, you know, or moments with, uh, with, with, with Mahatma Gandhi or with J.P. Narayan or with Indira Gandhi or with other people, you know. And so they, they recount their, their, their experience with them and, you know, where they, what, what they were. And so you actually get these accounts, these biographies happening, built with the accounts of other people. So the many possibilities ha that happen from these personal narratives, you know, from being used in the education system to serving as research material. So what I've done is just created this, you know, this archive, which anyone can access and use. And, and I'm actually putting them out as audio books as well, so that you can listen, you know, like, I like the radio, you can listen to someone's story for as long as you want, you know. So, so that's there. That, 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 that's the Mr. Santra project. So how can, and let's just say, if anybody wants to listen to any of the things that you've already done on Mitra Tantra, or yeah. if, they, if they have a story that they think that you, they would want to tell and you might be interested, they want to pitch a story to you, how can they do that? Well, the, the archive, as I said, is on YouTube, so anyone can access that. That's Mitra uh, Tantra? That it, is yeah, it, 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 it's the Mitra Tantra archive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are 20 conversations which have been curated up at up there. Uh, see, the, the invitation is open. So there's anyone at, see, at the moment we are, I'm functioning of my personal funds. So I, you know, and there have been no funds forthcoming. So I really can't step out of Bangalore, though I would love to. You know, there are hundreds and thousands of people who I would like to have their stories told. But uh, uh, so if there's someone here in Bangalore who wants to, you know, sort of tell their story, I'm ready. You know, we, we just let us know and we'll come in and uh, we, we, we'll film. You know? But we're also looking for support to be able to do that because, you know, right. quite simply, every conversation takes 200 man hours of work. You know, irrespective of who you are. Okay. So if you, you know, put numbers to that, it's a very expensive you know, I think to, so to sustain this operation, you know, we are looking at support to be able to just create this archive, which I believe is going to be a phenomenal resource for tomorrow, you know, of experience and wisdom. So, so it's got this less commerce and more about, you know, the, the just keeping this legacy for, for the next generation. Wow, that's, that's really incredible. That's great. So basically, look up Mitra Tantra on YouTube and, you know, be able to watch all this content. And mm -hmm. Another thing that you are doing, by the way, is this thing called An Order of the Loan. Yeah, what, yeah. What's, the, what's that about? An Order of the Loan basically means a woman alone. Yeah? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, but, you know, uh, see, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, 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 I've always wanted to sort of get theatre going in Bangalore, you know, sort of uh, do, do something here. But the problem is to get people to rehearse together. You know, there are no, not professional actors anymore who full time. So you've got to work with people's schedules. So the thought of actually trying to get a group of people together and work is well, well nigh impossible unless you know each other from college or whatever. You know? And then, of course, I had read these monologues which were written by, you know, Dario Fo and his wife, Franka Rami, way back in the 70s. Amazing pieces of writing, you know. And they're so relevant. And they deal with all the issues that women worldwide are dealing with, particularly in India. You know, so so, and as Franka Rame wrote in in a, her introduction, in this is in the late 70s. For the last 2,000 years, women have been going through exactly the same issue. Okay, so 2015, so 50 years after that, we're still doing the same. You know, the same. So I thought this these these stories are so relevant. So what I did was with this group of young performers we have you know indianized the stories made them their own we have you know to, oh. been telling these stories in the language of the performers so if someone speaks Canada, 
then it's a mix of english and kannada it's a mix a mix of english and bengali you know and uh, these are stories about women about you know domesticity sexuality abuse violence rape and the interesting thing is you know none of these stories sort of makes you know villainizes the other gender it's about understanding each other so you know in this environment today where you know men are bad women are good the other way around or whatever else oh. and down with this and down with that you know it's more about hey listen we are on this planet together and we have to coexist so how the hell are we going to make this work and let's let's build a conversation around what i have been going through and why and you know yeah. just understand you know and so now it alone is that it's it's about the stories of everyday women anywhere in the world you know and to these are the stories that we're taking into people's living rooms and you want to take them into living rooms anywhere so it could be in a city it could be in a town it could be you know in the village square it could be in a college cafeteria and say let's use the theater as a platform for conversation about things we never discussed or we don't want to discuss or we are afraid of discussing or you know let's sit face to face and say okay we started here this is the story right is this your story or isn't it your story you know so so that you know that solidarity within women to start with and then to say okay i never understood it this way for 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 the other gender to come across and say of course I've, now i see it from your perspective you know so that's the whole purpose of this project and you know to replicate it you uh, know maybe with with women elsewhere and just get the story told you know so that more more women are telling the story because you know what happens is that every time you have a a rape then people are outraged for about 48 hours you have a candlelight vigil for another you know a couple of days after that and there's down with patriarchy on social media at the end of the week it's all forgotten yeah you know and yeah. the next one comes along and the same yeah. cycle of outrage happens and it's it's you know hypocrisy to the extreme correct so how do you sustain the conversation sustain the conversation by keeping it going by you know saying okay this is the crux of the issues here you know so it's okay sloganeering but if you get to the bottom of it this is where it starts and this is how we need this is what we need to talk about and this is how we need to resolve it you know? so that's that's the whole purpose of an hour of alone and uh, yeah we we just we very recently started hopefully that uh, you know it will it will it will catch okay interesting that's that's quite cool actually um So another thing I wanted to ask you here I'm just saying is uh what well, second is uh keeping all of this now that we have the different mediums of of performing arts and I know we talked about the OTT thing in here has have the stories changed over the years or has this I I know the storytelling has changed in some ways but do you feel that the stories are still the same and I, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying it's wrong but Do you feel the stories have changed, or are they still the same? Still the human values. No, I see. I think uh, you know, with particular relevance. Let, let's take Bollywood for example. You know, Bollywood has marginalized, or you know, sort of uh, the 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 story about the village is now extinct. You know? That yeah. was the crux of Hindi cinema yeah. for so so long. Okay. today you know the village does not feature in mainstream cinema it features in marathi cinema it features in some indie little little film somewhere but so the stories are there but the problem is that the market is deciding which story is important you know and it it, it it's always the teeny bopper story it's about the young you know so it's catering to the american market rather than the indian market you know so it's driven by that so the stories which require to be told are not told because they're not profitable yeah. Yeah. we're not telling stories we're not telling stories about the breakup of family because it's an unpleasant subject we find you know of course we will you know every time we want to tell stories about history that story will be pulled down before it even begins because we're contesting that okay Yeah. So you know, all we are doing is we are creating these fictions on fictions and whatever else of these rosy pictures of uh, of you know of of everything, uh, which are which are very shallow. You know? 
so so we, for, most of the time we are we are lifting stories from hollywood anyway so yeah. so so as you said you know the, the, the original stories are very very few and far between no but so, i think also ranjan sorry I, i think that even if you are if even, even if you are focusing on telling human stories like a family breakup we take that and put that in an nri environment it has to happen in london because these right. things these things don't happen in villages they don't happen to normal right. indians exactly exactly because then it will go against our culture and to hurt someone's sentiments by doing that you see so 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 we don't believe in divorce and we don't believe in this and you know all our families are rosy so so there'll be some nonsense of the other which exactly. will start, you know but if you look at for example you know malayalam cinema and the other day there was a film about the great indian kitchen you know about the domestic yeah now and it's an amazing little stories which are coming up you know so so i mean i'm also thankful to the likes of netflix and the ott platforms that stories which otherwise you know would never have get to, got told in mainstream are finding spaces in in the ott platform the little stories the the b town and the c town story you know about aspiring youngsters about you know whatever problems you have so uh, the stories are going elsewhere so this still out there do you think that the ott platforms is going to kill the star system we have in india uh from what i read recently all the stars have now this is way with reference to uh with reference to america all the stars are now on netflix so they've signed up you know netflix is producing a prodigious amount of cinema prodigious yeah. amount all the stars of hollywood are now working on netflix films because there's a volume of work you know and anyway mainstream cinema has become as is working on cgi so so you barely require an actor most of the time it's it's about 90 99% special effects and you know everything else so so you you don't require performers there mm. you know? so they will migrate to spaces where they require performances you know so so they, i think the ott is giving is going to create work and economy for a lot of performers and hopefully some proper actors as well not stars i hope so. i hope so yes yeah, yeah. yeah. okay oh, okay interesting so what's uh, what else is on your plate at the moment i know you wear too many hats but we've talked about mitra tantra we've talked about uh, an aurat alone what else do you have on your plate at the moment well uh, i the flip side of that is all this other project called audio katha where i want to transform into audio stories literature of india you know so so i've started off by recording myself with the doing doing uh, you know there, there's the panchatantra there's the sarita sar the uh, katha sarita sagara there are such works of literature to which kids are totally unfamiliar you know and so i am trying to record them myself and to create soundscape you know versions of these that it can actually interest i don't know whether it will work i have no idea you know but i am doing it because i want to do it and I, because there is such great literature out there especially you know the stories written in english between the 1880s and the 1930s remarkable stories <coughs> remarkable translations of 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 literature you know uh with the most picturesque language and if at all one has to sort of revive the imagination that's the kind of language one has to use the flavor of english and whatever yeah. else so it, it it's my i'm just trying my luck at that and seeing maybe it will catch i did the just so stories it was great fun doing it and uh you know we we've put it on the different uh, audiobook platforms and it's been getting little trickles of sales so that's great satisfaction and then we take on the other work as well so yeah i got my plate full for for, for a long long time to come uh, and loving every moment of it wow that's amazing you know ranjan and i i i really hope that you get the support and i i don't mean just financially but you know in every possible way i hope you get the support to carry on what you're doing especially to keeping the performing arts alive in india for sure and i think it's important that especially the thing that you do with the women the stories that you're telling you know uh, of this a range of people the audio books that you're doing about indian history for our kids i think that's it's so amazing to just hear all of that 
And I think all of this also comes from the fact, besides your passion, there's also a discipline that you bring into each one of these art forms, correct? Because being powerful uh, in, in an art form without an education or a discipline is quite dangerous. And I think you know, that's... I, I, I think I realized this during the pandemic, especially, that it's very easy to just let the, let the, you know, the mind and the soul slip, you know? In, so, uh, uh, and if once that happens, you're in trouble. You know? mm. So you've got to sustain that soul, especially if you're in the performing arts, if you're in the art space. If you're looking for, you know, someone to fund you and all that to keep your spirits up, you know, that's not happening. No. You just, you need that discipline in order to keep your soul going for your own sake. You know, not for the sake of funding, not for the sake of anything else, just for your, you know, for your own personal sake. So, you know, that is the only thing which drives what I do. You know, it, 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 whether I make two coppers out of it or not is, is, is less the point. You know, it's about that I need to do this for the survival of my mind and my soul that I can get up in the morning and get to work and say, OK, I got this to do and there's a buzz going and, you know, I can, if I'm doing poetry today and this tomorrow and that, you know, that, that the day after. Not for anybody else. It's for me, you know. Okay. And if anyone else wants to enjoy what I'm doing, they're most welcome. But, uh, you know, if no one wants to look at it, that's not, not a, it, that, that's not a problem too. But, you know, if I am, if my purpose of doing anything was, you know, to only if I get likes and views and whatever else, then I'd be in a state of permanent depression, you know, with, 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 because I never get more than a half a dozen likes on anything I do anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, if I cross six, my that, that, that's a good day. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> All of six, hey. Uh, yeah, so so it, it is not for that you know it's just because i just like like the whole idea of doing it like the whole idea of the literature and meeting people and the stories and so on and so forth. Mm. how do people find you or your work online are you on social media yes i'm on facebook and i mean i have a facebook profile i am uh, ranjan kamath yeah yeah, yeah, Ranjan Kamath. You see, I mean, I, 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 am, I, I think I'm very unschooled or I'm sort of uh, an illiterate in terms of how to handle social media. So I have a presence there, but you know, I am certainly not uh, adept at, at milking it like the, you know, the, like the, the younger generation who are sort of, you know, default know how to use this whole system. Uh, so so, I, so I'm, I'm terrible at it. But, uh, and besides which, I think it takes up a huge disproportionate amount of time you know if you are spending your time marketing yourself on social media on the multiplicity of platforms that are where do you have time to do something productive you know well finally somebody who thinks like me I, I i've been written off told off by all my social media and marketing friends saying that I, I i do no justice to what i do because i don't market myself and i just think about it and i say what i do is here and I've, I've put it into the platform. I don't know how to market it because I always, I, I, I'm completely, I could be completely wrong on this, but I think marketing is about telling a lie. And, exactly. And my marketing so, friends hate me for it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think we should start a sanctuary. You may, maybe you should do a series called Endangered Species. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. for, for all these Luddites and Neanderthals you found, you know, yeah. who, who have no unschooled in the digital media, you Absolutely. know, yeah. <laughs> just create this club and survive together and, you know, drink, drink, drink that old monk or beer or yeah. whatever in the virtual yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. So I have a very dear friend of mine here in Singapore and he's a marketing guru, uh, mm -hmm. traditionally and now also digital marketing guru and he's worth his two cents. I know that he works for the great FMCG Global Corporate. And the only thing that we don't see eye to eye is the fact that I don't, I create content, but I don't market it. And he's lesson to me once was, you need to work backwards. So I, w I wanted to do something on men mental health. I wanted mm -hmm. to do a short film based on mental health. Mm -hmm. He said, he came to me and said, mental health today is so-and-so next year, you know what the date is, now work backwards. I said, no, it starts with the story I want to tell. Then I'm going to decide on how I want to tell that story, cinema or poetry or whatever. And that's what I'm going to do. I don't mm -hmm. want to work towards a date when I want to release it and then work backwards and 
put in a marketing camp. I said, no, I, I don't get it. And until I met you, I thought I was completely in the wrong. But I'm so glad you... you, you uh... No, but I mean, that, that's been the phenomenon ever since, you know, editors were not needed at newspapers and you had managers. Okay? Yeah. So the same managers are looking after film studios, newspapers, every form. You know, the, 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 the creative mind behind it have all disappeared into... So, or in, into extinction or near extinction or whatever. So, so it, it's a phenomenon which has occupied every every creative space, you know. And marketers and we 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 are all on the opposite side of the tracks. We never see eye to eye on people, yeah. you know. And but we live he, the world. Like, no, but here's a question for you. Say somebody comes up to you and says, "Hi, Ranjan, I'm a PR person, and I want to actually do some work for you for free, promoting your, you know, all your initiatives." What would your take be on it? I would give them my address. <laughs> <laughs> because, because that that is as fictional as as the unicorn, right? <laughs> it's as as mythical a creature as the yeah. unicorn. To go. If you find this person, let me know, right? Of Between course. the Loch Ness monster and the unicorn is of this course, fellow. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Whatever. You know, yeah. every time I have suggested that to someone and say, listen, you know, I am no good at marketing, but I'm quite happy that you take this and you market it and you make whatever percentage you want of it. I've got no problem with that because I'm unschooled in that. Yeah. It never happens. It absolutely never happens because they say everyone wants the money up front. Okay? Yeah. And I say, I have none. All I have is, is, is my body of work. Yeah. You know? So, so, and, and I believe it's worthy of, you know, for not, not, not to make money of it, but at least to share with other people what I know. Yeah? So, so I, I would please, please, if, if this person comes into your life, you Done. know, please let them know. <laughs> Here, here's a promise on air. Done. Yeah. <laughs> Anjan, it's been great, great talking to you. It's such a pleasure. As I said to you, at this before I could press record, I usually focus on the topic and then and then on the individual but in your case i've just wanted to just know soak in all of what you do what you represent and i'm so glad that we did this chat because it's you're like a dinosaur you know uh you there's not many of you left and i'm so glad that i've had the opportunity to connect with you and and have this time with you and i hope that we'll always stay in touch and our paths will cross going forward and uh I like the dinosaur reference before I fossilize completely. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that is so hard to do. <laughs> well, dinosaurs yeah, are coming back. Really, yeah. It's been great fun. It's been great fun talking. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you again when you do the Endangered Species series. <laughs> <laughs>